No, I appreciate everybody coming, and I apologize, and I want to thank uh, the lovely Michelle for uh, switching the, uh, the times for me. Um, you know, I, uh, I was supposed to be speaking tomorrow, but I'm actually going to be leaving uh, tomorrow. My wife's not feeling good, so I have to go do kid duty and all that good stuff. So my DEF CON uh, trip is unfortunately shortened. But uh, thanks so much for switching with me. I really can't thank you enough uh, for that. Just a quick intro. Uh, I founded Trusted Sec. It's an information security company. I was the chief security officer at Diebold. Uh, I've testified in front of Congress twice, and uh, the Democrats really hate me, apparently. Um, even though I hate them all, so I don't like anybody. So we're all good there. Um, been on the news a lot, Fox News, CNN, CNBC, Bloomberg, Katie Kirk Show. Um, I authored the Social Engineer Toolkit, uh, Fast Track, and a couple other tools out there. I was co-author of Metasploit, the Penetration Testers Guide, and I like to break a lot of stuff. And there's the old me versus new me. I'm uh, 87 pounds down so far, so I got about another uh, 15 to go and I'll be done. So, yeah. It does, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So if you look to the right, that's, that's no joke. That's right after I got done with Fox News. I usually don't wear pants. So um, <laughs> it's the attire. You don't, no one ever knows. And I'm uh, still the sexiest man alive. I don't know if you saw that. That is not photoshopped. That is not photoshopped. <laughs> Swear to God. It is not photoshopped. So uh, the funny story behind this one is I was on the Katie Couric show. And, uh, and uh, they had, uh, have you ever seen the show Sherlock? Yeah, uh, so the actor in there, is, uh, um, his last name is Cumberpatch, right? And so uh, it was saying, up next, one of the world's sexiest men alive. And then they removed the up next and just hovered that there for about five seconds for some reason. <laughs> and so, of course, all my hacker buddies, you know, take that and, you know, populate it. Now I'm the world's sexiest man alive. But I'm keeping it. I love what that looks like, all right? <laughs> this is me. And I also ride unicorns on the side. It's a actually a go to corn. Yeah, I just say go to corn. That is not photoshopped either, by the way. <laughs> so what I love about this talk uh, is, you know, I, I, I get to figure out different types of exploits and zero days and things like that. But what's really fun is going after a company and targeting them based on what I know their education awareness program is. And what's interesting is most of us do training uh, of our users the same way. Like we teach them not to click links or to hover over links to, you know, do certain things to look to see if it's fraudulent or not. And so as attackers, we know this type of information ahead of time. Regardless if you know, it's a rudimentary education awareness program all the way out to you know, an advanced education awareness program. So taking what we learn or what our users learn and manipulating that to use that against them um, is something that's absolutely happening right now and it's something that we like to use a lot of times. And so this talk today is about talking about where we're at today both from a pen testing side because I mean, you know, it's funny. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but I was a computer guy back in the day. I'm sure that's surprising to everybody. Um, but you know, I used to you know, play EverQuest and MUDs and all this other stuff while people were out playing football and all those other things in sports. And I think you know, we have these, these little things in the back of our heads that we want to relive those moments back when we were kids. So when we do like physical pen tests, for example, and we're breaking into buildings and piggybacking and stuff, like we try to make it like the coolest thing ever, right? We got to use some, some crazy high-tech gadget or, you know, we, we, we're climbing over fences, going through helicopter pads and breaking into a window to get into things when all you really have to do is just walk in the front door, right? And so we're going to be talking about how we kind of do things today and what we really need to do as kind of an industry um, to talk about the education awareness piece because it's one that I think is really important. And I mean, if you look at how attackers are busting in, it's predominantly through phishing, it's predominantly through social engineering, and it's probably one of the biggest you know, concerns that I have today uh, as far as the industry and how you fix it because there's nothing that's going to fix the human itself. I mean, next generation firewalls aren't going to do it or, you know, application whitelisting or your fire eyes are not going to do anything to stop us as attackers. So how do we figure that out and change ourselves a little bit different uh, to fix it? And that's what today's talk's about. And so here's how we hack today. And this is, uh, you know, as a hacker, what we typically do. And then I'll talk about what we teach our users and then we'll get around all that. So starting off, um, just a quick walk through what we talk and then we're just going to mess some stuff up real quick. And that's a true story. He did. <laughs> so today, um, has anybody gone through a phishing exercise before? Yeah? Normally you do, you know, a few hundred users or a thousand users. Um, may contain misspellings because I don't know if anybody's ever been through the first phishing exercise before in their organization. Is that not like heavily political and people almost lose their jobs? I mean, people get so ticked off that you sent phishing emails and you're targeting individuals that they get so pissed my language. They get so upset that, um, you know, that, that um, it really becomes a major issue. So, you know, you, but you, might, you probably sent to 100. You might use something like a fish me or something like that to send, you know, certain things out. But in most cases, you know, it's really not uh, simulating a lot of what we see today. 
Now, what I usually do is I only like targeting a couple of people, like one or two people, three or four max. And there, does anybody know the reason for that? What's the reason of sending it to like four people? Evasion, Evasion right? Yeah, I have less of a chance of being detected going after four people than I do 100 people within the organization. And just an example of this, um, I might have talked about this story before, but it's one of my favorite ones. Uh, I was doing a, uh, a social engineer for a, uh, a really large manufacturing company, and it was like their 100 year anniversary. And uh, you know, I, so I went to the website, and the first thing I do when I'm about to hack a website, or hack a company, is I go to the website and just learn about them. I want to figure out who they are so I can go after them. And so I go to the, the blog's post, and they're so excited. They make it, they're like changing like the logo on there, saying 100 year anniversary on the whole website. It's like a big PR thing. And, you know, the PR lady, um, you know, continues to like, you know, post her name up there and, you know, like she, she's the main person for all of it all. So I'm like, well, hey, I'll probably use this as an avenue of attack. And so I, I sent her an email and as soon as I sent her an email, I instantly almost got one back because I was impersonating a, a media news organization that wanted to do a story on them and how they were, you know, 100 years old, a great company, all that good stuff. And so our, our pretext was um, doing an uh, uh, iPhone giveaway. Right, so free iPhones that we're going to give out to the company. And basically it was like the first 100 employees get, get free, uh, free 100 iPhones. And that was what I was going to use as my attack. But just by her sending me an email back, does anybody know what that does? What's her sending me an email do? Establishes communication, right? So at least I got somebody to contact. But what's, what's the most important piece that I got from that? Why listen to spam? Filter possibly. Don't think technical. Not technical at all. Trust, but... Think about that email itself that when it comes to you. How about how she signs her name and the fonts and the coloring and you know, the, the, the phone numbers and everything that makes that email look legit. I don't want to trip any wires when I'm going to attack a company, right? So I, I mimic that. And so I send an email out and we send it out to, you know, we send it out to like four people at the time. Does anybody know how many, how many shells we ended up getting back, when we, how many people we compromised? It was like 75 because they're forwarding it to other people. Like it was like, you know, it was, and so, you know, the, the, the funny story about that is, um, you know, creating some sort of excitement and creating, you know, some sort of way of, of attacking a company definitely helps and works. And um, what's crazy is, you know, if you customize it to the company itself, your success goes up significantly. I mean, astronomically. Now, if you look at today's social engineering training, now the thing with social engineering training today, sorry, I had to put that one in there. I told Chris, this is the one slide that might be kind of not uh, kid-friendly, but after that, we're okay. Um, it, training today sucks because, you know, you, we require our users to literally go through, like, next, 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 finish, and then they may have to take a little test at the end of it, or they might go through some, you know, fishing exercise where they go to an online training. It's not fun and exciting, and it's not con uh, conductive of how we actually learn as human beings. And so if you look at today's social engineering training, I mean, maybe it's a one-day training session if you're lucky. Um, it's really boring, um, and maybe use a third party to fish you. Again, it doesn't really simulate real world stuff. You know, if you look at real world training, you know, what, what, is, what is testing of phishing supposed to do? What is it supposed to test? What's that? Employee confidence, okay. So the employee's portion, right? The, the, the person, but what about the technology piece too? Do you have the ability to thwart some attacks a little bit or maybe detect it so you can respond? It's a coupling of both people and education, right? And what we do for technology. And so when you look at what we're doing today, or what we're doing today, we're not testing that frequently. We're not looking at the technology we have in place to see if we can at least minimize some damage. And then from there, we rely for the users to start to do some other stuff. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. Now, what's funny is that we still do USB drops. I don't understand that. I've, I think like we've been doing that since like 1998 and uh, if, if USBs were out then, I don't remember. It's a long time ago. But anyways, I'm pretty sure they were out there and the auto run's been disabled for years. Like we don't use auto run anymore in any of our companies and we're still testing USB drops like finance, critical, you know, and then they put it in and all of a sudden it, you know, sends them. That's, that's a waste of time. Why not use the mail system? I love the, the, the hand mail system, you know, like you actually write out a letter or whatever and you send it out. You can be anybody you want to in the mail system and people believe you, like especially if you put like a letterhead on there and make it like look official and stuff, people will do whatever you want to. You can be like, hey, um, I need you to put this virus on your computer because we're testing something out for your organization. You just make sure you disable your antivirus first and then put it on and then they'll be like, what's well, in a letter and it's signed? All right, you know? <laughs> 
especially salespeople, by the way, they would do anything. I mean anything. I was on, I was on one time and uh, we wanted to see how far it would go because we had like broken into like a whole bunch of other places. And so I was on the phone with this guy and I'm explaining to him that you know, I was really interested in his product and everything. I was like, you know, and, and somehow we got into the discussion of, of you know, downloading, um, you know, my account information and, and, and like, you know, what my company was about and, and so they can scope it and price it for me. And so I'm like, well, just go to this website. And I'm like, www. You know, this is a virus.com slash real slash malware.exe. And that's what I sent him. And what did he do? He do and I still own this as malware.com, by the way, or whatever. But um, he downloaded it, he ran it, and he, he, and he installed it. And the best part was, I had him before he did that disable his antivirus. So I'm going to just right click here because some, for some reason, every once in a while it comes up. And he, like, literally, you can do whatever the heck you want to with people, especially salespeople. They're the best. I love them. Um, <laughs> But another one I did a while back is, um, and, and um, so when I was at Diebold, there was this guy named Stacy Gregerson who was, uh, he was like one of the, like, have you ever met like the disgruntled DBA guy, you know, in your organization? He's like the guy that like, you know, has the crazy hair and everything and he's got the Gandalf staff, you know, you shall not pass before me, you know, type of guy, right? And um, so Stacy was a bit like that type of, you know, real disgruntled guy. So we used to mess with him all the time, you know, like, you, you know, so we'd like, you know, launch, launch Nerf guns at him and things like that. But we came up with a really good prank and it was, um, we, took, we disassembled his keyboard and we soldered together what's called a Tinsy device and it's a little, little uh, hardware manipulator. And um, all they would do once we assembled it and put it back is they would move everyone ran, randomly, would move his mouse up to the left, like far, far left of the corner and start clicking and then randomly hitting keyboard uh, uh, sequences, okay? And so after the first day he starts swearing and you hear him like hitting the, you know, like, you know, all, you know he's, he's getting mad, right? Well, I figured, you know, my other buddy that was with Josh would, you know, let him know after a while that something was probably awry or switched it out or whatever. Well, I went on a business trip and I didn't come back for a week. <laughs> totally forgot about it. I get home and back and Stacy's literally on the verge of quitting. Like, I mean, he's like, like, so he had worked at the help desk and they had swapped out his docking station, his laptop, the, the mouse, but everything but the keyboard and I was still doing it. <laughs> and he's screaming and yelling and everything and, and it's just, it's just terrible. So I'm like, hey, uh, Stacey, can you remember, I want to talk, talk to you about the DBA stuff that we're doing for next year. And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, he's like, and there's, you just could tell he's mad. So then I had Josh swap off the keyboard like nothing ever happened and everything started working okay. So I, he still doesn't know to this day. Um, so I like to keep it that way. Thank you. <laughs> um, but mail systems are great. I always love using the mail. Um, today's SE in person. Now, what's funny is, you know, again, we go more and more sophisticated um, as we go along. Like, I, I feel like every talk I hear about the physical stuff is like, I was, you know, I was climbing in the mud and I dug a tunnel underneath this, this company and then I was up in the data center and then I planted a bug that, you know, was, you know, it uses the NSA private satellite to communicate over with and that's how we were able to get around it when, you know, the back door for the data center is open, you know? And that's how I feel like we've kind of gone as an industry and just as an example today, you know, you make it simple and easy and what's funny is um, we were doing a, a pen test, a physical pen test for a store location. Now, you know stores that you can go into, like a grocery store or, you know, like a Walmart. I'm not going to say who it was at all, in fact. I'm not, not going to mention the name that I, we did work for. But it's a big store, right? One that you'd probably frequent on a regular basis. So we know, so one of the trophies, two of the trophies were getting access to the server room. And the other one was being able to steal the point of sale slash cash register that actually has the cash in it, right? And I'm like, all right, I mean, I'll, that's fine. So what I, does anybody know what I did to steal that cash register? So I walk in, right? Like, wearing like this, you know, I'm just walk in. It's a cash register. Lock pick. Grab it. Sorry, that's okay. It's going to connected. Walk out. Walk out. So I think it was heavy, by the way. So, okay. So I walk out of the store and I put it in my car and then I open it up. And there's like four grand in cash in there. I'm like, oh, shoot. Um, I'm like, maybe I should go take it back or whatever. So, I went back, but I left the, the um, thing in the car and I went, one of our guys was watching it. And so I'm like, well, I'll see what else I can get into it because they probably know that I walked out of the building with the cash register and they're probably freaking out of where the cash register was, right? So I walk back in and I walk to the server room. No one stops me or anything. And I, and I start lockpicking the server room. There's like cameras and stuff everywhere. I'm just like... Open it up, walk in. I'm in there for like 45 minutes. I'm like making noise. I'm like screaming. I'm like yelling. And I'm like, I'm like I got music. I got techno music jamming. You know? I mean, hey, someone's got to come over here. 
Nothing. And that's the thing. I mean, people won't challenge you if you look like you belong. Uh, one of our guys, Paul, was doing a, a, a corporate headquarters location. And you walk in, there's, there's you know, those badge access here with the, the card readers and everything. You might be like, oh, hey, I might use a prox mark to clone the badge or whatnot. No, no, they didn't, they didn't go that route at all. There, there's sitting, people badging. There, there's a window there that's got one of those little locks on it that you know, it may, doesn't allow the window to move. They're sitting there picking the window lock as people are coming in and out of lunch. They open it up and they boost each other up to get into the window <laughs> to get into this place. And people are like, hey, do you, you need any help? We're like, no, we're good, we're fine, it's good. <laughs> it's ridiculous. You can literally get away with whatever you want to as long as you have confidence. It's all you need. It's like, hey, are you supposed to be here? Yup. Okay, cool. <laughs> Prime example, you know, I, I did the whole black ops thing, right? You know, like I, I, I wanted to like be that, that guy that was hopping over fences and stuff. So I had the, the, the camouflage outfit with the throw mic, you know, and, and, and I had the black beanie and I had lock picks in my hand. I mean, I'm like, literally, it's, I created what burglars look like in this, in this thing, okay? I mean, I literally, if I, if I, if I would have had like a little money bag in the back of my sack, you know, it would have been, it would have been me. So I do this whole, you know, black ops thing, and I climb over the, you know, the, the, the um, locks and everything. I climbed over the barbed wire fences. We put some rugs over, climb over, get into this door, get into the door, and we're, like, evading security. And there's a security guard sitting there, like, right in front of us. It's a two-level foyer. And literally, we're, like, tiptoeing across this guy. And you can, he can see us, and we can see him, but he's on that, you know, his back is to us. And I can see us walking across the video monitor. I'm like... <laughs> You know, just, so, you know, we, we were in for a while and everything, and we go around, and we're about to leave, and there, where, where we came in at, there's uh, basically like the double-sided doors that kind of go like this. There's a nice little gap in between there. And I go to the exit on, I look through, and I'm like, oh, we're screwed. And as soon as I said that, the security guard, there's a shift change, security guard comes in. This guy must have been probably like 75 or 80, and I felt so bad for him, because like literally the guy's like, whoa, what are you guys doing here? What are, who are you? And he's got his like flashlight there and everything. I'm like, like what are you guys doing here? I'm like... Listen, man, and listen, granted, I have a beanie on, I got lock picks in my hand, you know, I got the throat mic, you can see the throat mic and the, the CIA wacky talky looking things here and everything, and I'm like, listen, man, I, I'm in IT, the service crashed, this place blows, I'm like, I'm gonna get out of here. He's like, oh, man, you guys scared the heck out of me, you guys, I didn't realize you guys were in here, he's like, have a good night, and I'm like, all right, cool. Yeah. Nothing sophisticated, you don't, do, you don't do anything sophisticated, you don't have to have throat mics, I never use those throat mics again, I mean, they're cool, but I never use them again. So stick, stick to things that are easy. So what, should what do we teach our users? Um, don't provide sensitive information, call our ID checks, suspicious activity. What's funny about um, personal information is most people don't view corporate data as, as sensitive information. Although if you start challenging them on like their birth date or possibly passwords um, or social security numbers, they get really defensive. And so you know, not challenging them on certain things like um, you know, their, their password and, and date of birth are good things. Um, but what I like doing is the whole phone spoofing thing, which is super simple. And, um, you know, phone spoofing, you can be whatever you want to and, you know, literally be someone super, super easy. Now, this one was funny because um, we didn't use phone spoofing in this case, but we basically broke into a corporate building and we're, we're running around trying to find a conference room that we can get into that we can call the data center. And so we get to the conference room and I open, you know, I hit, the, I hit this conference room line and I dialed down to the data center and said, hey, you know, I'm, I'm James, you know, Weber or whatever. I'm just making up a name. So I'm James Weber um, in security. I, I have these three auditors here. Um, you know, can you let them down and, and sign them in and give them access to the PCI closets and all this other stuff? And he's like, who'd you, who'd you say you were? I'm like, James Weber. I mean, and, and I did my homework, right? So, you know, um, the guy that was at the data center who I, was, or who I was impersonating was like, you know, completely like four states away. So it wasn't like I was saying somebody locally, right? I'm like, oh, just James Weber. He's like, I'm best friends with James Weber and you're not James Weber. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, yeah, I am. <laughs> I'm like, I got, a, I got a cold. He's like, oh, you got a cold. Okay, hang on. So while I'm doing this, he's actually instant messaging this James Weber guy saying, hey, are you on the phone right now? And so I'm like, listen, man, can you let these guys in? He's like, you're not who you say you are. You need to get out of here right now or figure out. He's like, you can hear him talking and mumbling in the back. And I'm like, oh, God. So I hang up. We're like bolting out of the building, like running, you know, trying to get out of there. But, uh, I mean, trying to be believable, phone, sp phone spoofing works really well. Now, here's an interesting one. Uh, here's what users are taught, which are, is really the hover. Right? Is everybody unfamiliar with the hover <laughs> technique, right? So, you know, hover over the link, and you make sure it's a legitimate link, right? Because if you hover over, it's got to be legit, right? <laughs> right? All right. We're going to defeat that. Mm -hmm. 
So one of my tools that I write is the Social Engineer Toolkit. And if you're not familiar, it's open source. Um, it's a framework for um, testing uh, social engineering. And you know, it really allows you to create fast and effective ways of, of targeting individuals and going after them in real world scenarios. Um, some of the attacks are pretty, pretty darn sophisticated, like uh, the Java applet attack that I use all the time. Uh, we usually have about a 94% uh, success rate with that one, depends on the, the, the company itself. Um, but in most cases though, um, when we use it, it bypasses application whitelisting, it gets around next generation firewalls, it gets around your fire eyes and everything else out there, which is wonderful. Um, and it compromises them and gives you access to their computer. Um, so it's a good way of testing how well your technology controls are really working against uh, real world stuff. Now just a warning, this is just a tool. Using anything out of the box, you probably won't be successful, so you gotta customize it, you need to do research about who you're going after. And most importantly, that's doing your, your reconnaissance and your homework. When we go after a company, we know exactly what technology to use. Does anybody here not use LinkedIn? Not one hand, right? Now we got half a hand. Got, kind of thinking about it. Okay, you good. We got one hand. All right. So LinkedIn is wonderful because we love to brag about ourselves, especially our experience. So we're like, hey, I, I'm the semantic, you know, firewall admin for SEP12. Thank you. Appreciate that. You know, or hey, I use you know this type of firewall. I use this type of technology. I can profile your entire company and all of its technology without even having to actually go and, and uh, attack your organization to develop in the first place. So as long as they know that, I can start to create my attacks based around your company that you have out there. Now in this case, let's do a quick demo here. I want to show you one real fast. You watching a movie over there? Is it a movie? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to launch the social engineer toolkit. And I'm going to use what's called the web jacking method. Uh, I'll get my IP address real quick. And I'll just go ahead and clone something like accounts.google.com uh, because it's an easy one. Oh, I need internet access. Hang on. That would help. Here. You have internet access? Yeah. Oh, right there? That makes things easier, Chris. Thanks. Yes, no problem, buddy. Now let's go to Lemon Party, I don't know. <laughs> My revenge is finally here. <laughs> Any authentication or anything? Perfect. All right, good. So we'll go ahead and clone the website. It's going to go and do everything for us. Um, and then basically we have our, our website here that we can use. So if I go to this website. Now what I usually do in this case is I'll usually target like a company that... Um, you know, I find a website on the, out, on the outside that looks legitimate, like whether it's a benefits website. I love going after healthcare because it's a good priority. Or, you know, other things that might be um, internet accessible that they would be familiar with as a normal user. And why I like doing that is I'll create a website that looks familiar, like it'll, it'll look in every way, shape, or form. And I'll even throw security ling language in there, like make sure that the website itself is using SSL. Make sure you hover over the link to make sure that's going to a legitimate website. Like, tell them exactly what they need to do to re refresh them. Use their education awareness against them. In this case, I make the website look nice and pretty like it would be. And then, then they tell them to hover over the link. Now this is just an, a demo here, so we'll, we'll hover over the link here in a second. But hopefully, you know, if we tell them, hey, hover over the link, it should be legit. It should be, right? So what's that say in the bottom left? You may see that? It's good, right? That's a sell, right? It's going to accounts.google.com, right? Everybody here think that's legit? Well, you guys are saying no now, of course, but. No, I can see that it is not legit. <laughs> it looks as far as we know in our browser, https colon forward forward slash accounts.google.com is owned by Google, correct? Yep. Okay. So if we click this link, what should happen? It should go to accounts.google.com, accounts right? Well, it does actually. It'll go there for about a couple seconds. And then it'll replace the website with our malicious website really fast without the user knowing. All right, so go, let's go and click it. No magic, ready? Ready? Click. We're at accounts.google.com. Quick switcheroo. Oh, I'm gonna do an update. Hang on. Username. 
Now, when I enter my username and password, it actually redirects them back to the legitimate Gmail site, okay? And over here, we have our username and password, right? We're able to harvest it. So why that one's so devastating is because it takes advantage of what we're taught as users, right? We tell our users to hover over the link and that the link itself is holy and, 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 and if you click on the link and you verify it, you're good to go. In this case, it's not the case. Um, you know, what's great about, uh, about exploits, right, um, is they, they work really well if you're the one that wrote them. But as soon as they're published, you have a very small window of how often you can use them, correct? I mean, as soon as a new Internet Explorer zero day comes out, um, and it's published in Metasploit, all the antivirus vendors release signatures in like two minutes, you know, so that you can get this, uh, you know, so they can get detected. What? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, who knows? It's probably another, I was probably testing something. Um, <laughs> but in this case, um, <laughs> what? Like you guys have never typed poop in the email field before? <laughs> Just to see if it was working right? No, I never have. That's not true, Chris, because I have all your accounts. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, but I mean, in, the, in this case, you know, it really takes advantage of how they are as users to, to trust that information. And this one works really well. That's probably my favorite one to actually use during social engineering because it's really so impactful. I mean, people can't tell that, that they're redirecting to a different website, that they're seeing a different website. And I usually um, use a lot of uh, um, domain names and things like that. Now my next one, if you haven't seen it, I'll just do this really quick. And what I'm doing is I'm just going to create a malicious Java applet. Now this new, um, new version in set on version 6 when I redesigned it, um, does analysis on the machine itself. Um, it looks to see what the best exploitation method is. And what it does is it actually goes and uh, targets um, based on what they have installed. Now, is everybody here um, migrating off of Windows XP to Windows, either Windows Vista or Windows 7, or you're fully you know, migrated? Thank you. As, as an attacker, thank you. The more you're upgraded, the better it is for me to hack you. So please keep, keep upgrading as fast as you possibly can. If you're using Windows XP, probably better off. Just throwing that out there. And reason for that is, is this awesome thing called PowerShell. Everybody familiar with PowerShell? So PowerShell does this amazing thing for us, um, which gives us uh, basically a full-fledged programming language at our fingertips. And there's, you know, don't get me wrong, PowerShell is amazing, but it's also extremely powerful. There's not a lot of protection around it. Um, just as an example, uh, we did a talk a few years ago, um, and there was what are called execution restriction policies. And has anybody ever been to Microsoft's website and, and looked at what it says about my, um, execution restriction policies? When we did our talk, it said, execution restriction policies are a security feature to blah, 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 right? After our talk, do you know how they fixed our flaws that we found? Execution restriction policies are not a security feature for... <laughs> so PowerShell, you can basically run, once you get command execution, um, you can do whatever you want to with it. And um, a really great guy named Matthew Graber came out with a really awesome attack. Um, which allows you to inject uh, power sh or straight up shell code into memory uh, through PowerShell itself. And, it, and, and the technique circumvents execution restriction policies and a lot of other stuff. And so basically you get uh, full command execution in the PowerShell process, which is what? What is PowerShell? A whitelisted application trusted, right? Because we have to run updates and things like that. If you disable PowerShell, you actually break windows. It's wonderful. So let me show you this really quick. This is gonna use the PowerShell injection technique. So we go ahead and run this. And we can make the name anything you want to, obviously. Um, so in this case, we did go to corn by. Um, but I mean, you can make the name anything you want to. So if I'm targeting a company, I'm going to make the company name look legitimate in every way. As soon as I hit run, it automatically executes, finds the best exploitation method for this computer based on what we have installed. And then from there, it doesn't get detected by anything in the universe, and we get full access to their computer. 
So really easy you know, and fast way of, of cloning a website, grabbing it, bringing it in, and not getting uh, attacked by any of the um, preventive measures that we have in place, like next generation firewalls and all that good stuff. Doesn't do a look a squat. Yeah, um, reason for that is I, um, I have it in my, in my configuration settings um, to pipe me two back just in case I lose one. Sometimes if you have one shell coming back and you lose it, then you don't have your reliable method, so I always get uh, two sent back to me no matter what, just as a failback. The worst part you can possibly imagine is when you um, have a fallback and you, like, your shell closes or you accidentally type exit instead on, you know, for some reason and then you lose your shell and you have to re-exploit them again. Sucks. You can just call the sales guy up. It doesn't make a difference anyway. <laughs> So some things to ponder on this, it's really hard to protect against this because um, of we're actually going after users. Now is anybody here, <laughs> Chris, are you trying to set the mood or something? Man? All right. um, has anybody here uh, implemented two-factor authentication before? All right, a few of us. Now what's interesting is ones like phone factor, for example, they've really messed up an implementation. Does anybody know why they've messed up an implementation? It's not enrollment, it's, it's how we train our users. Now RSA, granted how much you want to make fun of them or not, RSA had a proper technique for it. They actually had a physical device that they'd actually have to physically type in something in order to log in, correct? The way phone factor works is you go to log in, you enter your username and password, and then it'll send you a text message or, e or call you, right? And then you, from there you say, well yes, I'm logging in right now. What is a user going to say every single time? Yes, I'm logging in. Just as a prime example, we're doing a pen test. This is the first time I ever ran into phone factor before, for the very first time. And I type in my, I fish some people and I, I type in the username and password, didn't realize they had two factor authentication. And it says, we're calling you. We'll let, you know, do you, you know, to verify who you are. I'm like, oh. I'm like, uh oh, uh oh, uh oh, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? What do I do? Then it logged me in. I'm like, whoa, what do I do? What do I do? And so I'm sitting there freaking out because I logged, I logged myself in. I'm like, and so I thought, you know, maybe it was like a bug on, in their implementation. And we started talking and figuring it out and talking to the user. He's like, well, I'm, I, was, I was pretty sure I was logging in somewhere. I, I don't know, my phone or whatever. I mean, I get these prompts every once in a while. So, so it worked out really well. Um, the, <laughs> the crazy part about it, the, well, it worked out for us really well, not for them. But the crazy part about it is I've done phone factor about six times and I have not had a time where it did not work. Not once. That's crazy. 100% success ratio on two factor authentication, not good. All right? I mean, literally now, it's, it, I'm like, username and password? Oh, yes, thank God it's phone factor. Let me go get a beer. <laughs> Come back. Oh, cool, I'm logged in. Sweet. All right. So you know, you know, implementation is really important with two-factor authentication, and you know how you implement it is extremely important. Obviously, things to fix this are up-to-date software, uncategorized sites. If you haven't seen that, by the way, uncategorized sites, um, you actually have the ability in most of your um, content filtering software, like what, whether it's blue code or scan safe or whatnot, to um, do what's called uncategorized or unclassified sites. And sites that aren't registered, like for like normal you know use or whatever, show up as uncategorized, and that's going to be about 95% of your phishing sites out there. Now, in order to get categorized, it's extremely trivial, but most attackers don't do it. Like, for example, uh, one of the ones, I'm not going to mention which one it is, but if you actually clone their website, like their own website, like the content filtering company's website, they actually classify you as a content filtering company. <laughs> it's like, okay, cool, thank you. you know? So the, the, the technology behind classification isn't spot on in any way, shape, or form, but it's definitely another step because most people don't submit their websites to anything like this. Um, Obviously, things like least administrative rights. Has anybody ever um, used uh, the Enhanced Mitigation Experience Toolkit before or Emmet? If you haven't, you definitely need to check it out. It's, it's slick for, especially it's for Windows. Um, it's a free tool for Microsoft, and it literally um, profiles a lot of the different um, attack mechanisms that we use as exploit writers. Um, like for example, uh, there's these things called you know ASLR, address, address space layout randomization, um, or data execution prevention, or DEP. Um, those are two common preventive measures in Windows. Now, in order for me as an attacker to, to exploit something, my whole point is to crash you know, something and then redirect it to my code. Now, in order to execute my code, I have to get around the preventative measures in Windows. And one of those mechanisms to do that is what we call return-oriented programming or ROP. And um, 
as a, what, what Emmett does is it profiles those methods of how I actually do ROP or try to remove a lot of the protection mechanisms out there and it actually stops them from working. So just as an example, all of the exploits that are in Metasploit right now don't work with Emmett install. All right? Now, that doesn't, that doesn't work, uh, that whole statement doesn't work for Java because Java just sucks. Okay? So Java has, a, you know, the sandbox escapes aren't necessarily classified as exploits. So um, in most cases, it's not going to stop those, but it will stop a lot of the zero days you saw out there. Uh, and what's interesting is um, this is one of the exploits that uh, was, was identified in the wild. It was a zero day um, ActiveX control XML DOM that came out about a month ago. And if you notice here, the link, it actually looks for the emmet.dll and if it finds it, it actually kills itself and doesn't run. Really neat. Now, nothing's perfect. Um, there was a researcher, Jared DeMott, that did some research on Emmet and um, Cygnus as well from Offensive Security and they came out with ways of bypassing and circumventing Emmet. So just a heads up, it's not 100% foolproof, there's ways of bypassing it, but mic Microsoft just released version 5 um, last week. Um, so it's, it's, you know, they're definitely making strides and continuing the product line, it's a big strategy for them. And what was crazy is um, when I was on the, the Katie Kirk show, all right, well, I, has anybody ever seen this one before? Has anybody not seen it before? A lot of people. All right, just, let me just show you something really fast for you really quick, okay? It's well worth it. I had these people. So I, when I was on the Katie Kirk show. Um, Sexiest man alive. That's right. Look at that. No, I, got, I can, it's okay. I can, well, if you have audio, that'd be great. But if not, I can just do this. No, this works out great. Thank you. Kevin, we're good. Perfect. So in this case, um, I had recommended Emmett to basically soccer moms and folks that aren't necessarily technological, like grandmas and things. I sat on their forums and actually responded to every single person that had a question. It was like 600 of them. And I responded to every single one, but they were installing Emmett and hadn't installed and configured on their machines without me helping them, period. I mean, that's a huge feat. That's a really big protection mechanism. But this one's funny because uh, I actually felt like really horrible doing this because it's like I'm pretty evil, but it's fine. This isn't staged, by the way. Schmidt is here. She has two teenage daughters. She lives in Connecticut. And Stephanie, I understand that you believe your computer is unhackable. Why? Well, I, I, it's something that's really on my mind and very concerned. This here. She has two teenage daughters. She lives in Connecticut. And Stephanie, I understand that you believe your computer is unhackable. Why? By the way, first wrong thing to say to me, by the way, just <laughs> mistake number one, ma'am, okay? Well, uh, I'm, it's something that's really on my mind and very concerned about it. I, I feel like all of my antivirus software is up to date. I've taken a lot of precautions. I have a computer consultant who comes into my home to check on these things. And so I really feel strongly that, that we have done everything that possible to try and protect my, myself and my daughters. I mean, it's something that's really worrisome for me. Well, that, that's very impressive because you seem like you're extremely ahead of the curve. So we decided to put David to the test to see if your comfort level with your security is actually warranted. Tell us what happened. How did you do when we gave you the challenge of... What's that look say, by the way? <laughs> I'm like, I've been waiting for this all my life. <laughs> ...into Stephanie's computer. So, you know, Stephanie, I would say, was actually one of the, the top 5% of what I would say is being most secure. Um, you know, everything up to date, really locked down, all of those good things. And um, so I literally had plugged in, opened my computer up, and less than 10 minutes or so had a fully designed uh, website that looked real in every way and shape or form of a website that you would visit every single day. And I sent an email out, and uh, as soon as I sent the email out, it looks very believable in every way. Uh, she clicked the link, um, and then from there, again, less than 10 minutes of setup time and hacking and all that stuff, I had full access uh, to her computer, uh, her webcam, got around all of her antivirus, everything completely. You are kidding me. Wow. <laughs> oh. Oh, it gets worse. <laughs> Trust me. This is when I started feeling like, like, I'm like, oh, I better just scale it back a little bit and not be so cocky because uh, I feel really bad right now. Tell us oh some my of the gosh. things that you were able to see. Well, the first thing we did is we, we enabled her. Oh my uh, God, that's my. We enabled her webcam and we were actually able to monitor 
everything that was going on in her house, everything from her daughter uh, working on her computer uh, to Stephanie actually walking through the house itself. Uh, we actually enabled the audio as well so we could actually hear everything that was going on at the same time. Uh, so we can listen. <laughs> Yeah, that's enough, that's enough, that's enough. I feel bad enough. We're going to download that. Uh, it's on my Vimeo page. You, I can send it to you. It's, uh, if, you just, if you look for the Katie Kirk show, Dave Kennedy, you'll find it. But, uh, yeah, and, but uh, interesting enough, this is no joke. Like a week after I was on her show, they announced it's getting canceled. So I don't know if that's, that's probably not related. You never know. So, no, that was a good one. But, you know, what was interesting, though, it, you know, it, it really resonated with the people there. And they were installing things like Emmet. And, like, then I got a call from Microsoft. They're like, dude, we're, like, the, we're the ones that developed Emmet. And I can't believe you pitched it to Soccer Moms and it's working. That's amazing. You know, and that's, that's awesome, right? Getting it, I mean, and not, nothing against Soccer Moms, just technology-centric folks, you know, different demographic of people um, installing things that, that are, you know, traditionally probably pretty complicated. And it worked really well. Um, so again, there's a few different ways of disarming Emmet. I'm not going to get into these. Um, but the good news is a lot of these have been fixed in version 5. Um, Jared DeMott's still, uh, techniques are still not. And so we talk about fixing stuff. You know, I look at, at a couple people chuckled because like we're old now. It's weird, isn't it? Anyways, so we're using the same types of attacks that were literally crafted in the early 90s about, you know, the USB drops and, and the CD-ROM drives. We're not you're not you know, evolving to what real attackers are doing on a regular basis. I mean, we need to start to look at continuing and going forward on education awareness, training people in the way that it actually works. And for me, the most critical program period in, in a security program is education awareness. That and monitoring detection, pretty close to each other. But in my case, you know, when you can train your users, they may know what happens when you train your users on security. Does it become a lot more easier to implement security in your company because they understand why you're doing it? I mean, when we had an education awareness program, I, I implemented two-factor authentication over a weekend. No problem. NAC, six months. I may have done a global company with 20,000 uh, employees, NAC in six months. It's a pretty big feat. But it was cool. They were fine with it. They were cool with things breaking. I mean, I didn't, I mean every, every once in a while you get the guy that was you know, crazy and whatnot. But, I mean, they, understand, they understood why we were doing it and the reasons why we were doing it. And it was because of education awareness. I mean, I really feel like if I didn't have that, my security program at that company would not be successful. Because people understood why I was doing it. And that's huge. It's beneficial in every way. And guess what? I went from like four people in security to like 55 people in security because of it. It's a pretty good deal, right? Actually having people to do the work. So we look at a program, um, Bruce Schneider actually came out and said in one of his blog posts that uh, security uh, awareness doesn't work and that it should be through attrition and it should be through, you know, basically, you know, what we do and, uh, to protect the users. And I'll be honest, I, coming from someone that's actually implemented a program, that's absolutely inaccurate. There's no question about it. Education awareness 100% works. Users aren't stupid. You know, we're not, they're not people that are just dumb and they can't ever learn things. I mean, think about it. When we start a company, do we know certain things like how not to behave, like streaking down the office is probably bad, right? Um, you know, we learn certain things and what's acceptable behavior and what's not. And it's the same thing on technology. I mean, we have to be able to communicate in a way that we can learn. And you, to be honest with you, if our users are the ones that are being called stupid because they are clicking at things all the time, then we're the stupid ones for not communicating them in the right way. And that's the truth. I mean, if we can't communicate to our users and teach them in a simple way, we're failing as security people in general. And this is your number one exposure, period. Number one, that's what we need to be focusing on, not the next-gen firewalls and the application whitelisting tools and, you know, whatever's happening out there with APTs and, you know, cyber kill chains and all that other stuff we hear. It's our users. Our users are going to figure out things that we don't ever get to see. So the first thing I did um, at Diebel was, um, you know, basically sell to my executives first of what I was going to do. That's the most important, right? Uh, because no one cares about security unless you have buy-in from certain people. And that's what we did first in our campaigns and everything else. And then from there, you build the program. I mean, I used to, I, um, when I used to do things, I would relate to people. Like, for example, the target breach was huge because everybody was impacted by it. I'd be like, hey, you know, if you guys got compromised at Target, here's the steps you could do. Here's the phone numbers to contact. If you're using um, you know, a specific bank, here's the numbers to contact for that. You know, here's what we recommend. Boom. You know, you're trying to help them again. Awesome. Hey, Heartbleed happened. Okay, great. You know, what does Heartbleed mean? What does it mean for your personal information? 
This is what it means. This is what we're doing to protect you, right? Here's who you need to contact if you're using because they're still vulnerable right now. Wow, cool. Newsletter, how to protect your kids on Facebook. Fantastic. You know, when you can relate to them in a certain way that actually relates back to their homes, they actually care. They actually want to do something differently. And, um, you know, you just got to be willing to do it and spend the time to actually do it. Step three, testing the company. You know, actually going through and testing and seeing what happens and how your users respond and if you're getting better. That's how you know it's effective. And whether or not your technology can kind of help with it as well. And uh, last but not least, just maintaining. I mean, seeing where your current, current level is that you're happy with and just maintain from that. Um, you just keep moving forward and maintaining that program itself. Like if I need to implement 10 character passwords, the user understands why I need to implement 10 character password and what I need to do with that. Or two factor authentication or whatever it ends up being. You know, again, try to implement two factor that doesn't just say yes, you're okay to log in, right? Anybody have any questions? No questions? Yes, sir. Have I ever done uh, two-factor authentication using chip and PIN cards? Yes, I've seen that definitely implemented. And those are, those are absolutely great. Um, you know, something physical that's there that actually has to authenticate somebody is phenomenal. Um, you know, obviously you have the same exposure as anything else. You know, if I'm able to steal that and then the credentials, but your probability and likelihood is so much lower um, than me as an attacker remotely doing it. So I'm a huge advocate of physical devices, which is more of a pain in the butt to manage. I mean, and soft tokens are okay too. Um, as long as they physically have to copy and paste that number into that environment itself or whatever it ends up being. But I, I, I don't have any quar uh, quarrels with that whatsoever. Yeah. Yep. So the, qu the question was what happens when you're confident and that doesn't work, right? You go to jail. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, no, try, try everything you possibly can or create different diversions or techniques in order to, to really try to get out of it. Like, for example, um, we were, you don't mess with law enforcement. If, if law enforcement are called, you definitely want to like, let them know what's going on. But just as an example, we're breaking into an energy company. We come out and law enforcement's there waiting for us and like, you know, like freeze and all that other stuff. And um, we're like, hey, man, you know, we're, just do I mean, we're not going to lie to a police officer. I'm just like, hey, just want to let you know we're, we're hired to do this. Um, on behalf of this company, this is what I'm doing, you know, to let them know. And the police officer's like, oh my God, that is so cool. Are you serious? Are you freaking serious? And he's like, is there any way, I, like, I only do this cop thing like part time, is there any way I can get a job? And I'm like, dude, Mr. Man, I'd be cool with that. Didn't ask us for an ID, didn't ask us for like, you know, like the get out of jail free card or anything. Like, I didn't do, identify anything. Just let us go, right? Just let us right go. So, I mean, there's certain situations where, I mean, honestly, maybe the best policy, depending on how, how deep you are. And there's ways of getting around everything. I mean, if you're persuasive enough, I mean, you have a good, prob a good chance of getting away from it. But sometimes you just, I mean, sometimes you just fail. I mean, there's, time, there's plenty of times I failed. I, I was doing a, um, a, a, um, a company in, I think it was like Minnesota or something like that. There's yeah, still people there apparently. But uh, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. I'm from Cleveland. There's, there's nobody there. So, um, you know, I was breaking in this building and I figured, hey, they're a big company. They're not going to have um, any of the door contacts, um, you know, triggered uh, and triggered any alarms because it's, you know, it's nighttime. I was going to go through the front door. So I get to the front door and I lock pick and I open it up and I get to the other door and I lock pick and I open it up and I'm inside and everything's great. Everything's fine. All of a sudden I see the cop cars coming. You know, it's like three of them like, <laughs> I walk out and it's like, you know, listen, I, I ain't messing around. You know, you mess up. Things happen. Um, you know, it's just a matter of, you know, telling the honesty when you do it though. Any other questions? Where? Over here? Yep, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It does. So there's a config option inside of Toolkit for UNC embedding. And so as soon as they visit the website or you can send it through an email or whatnot, it has the UNC uh, path embedded into it, which um, then it has a listener in the background. And as soon as you connect to it, it automatically scrapes the, the username and password field. Um, and then you get your you know, NTLM challenge response uh, once that you can crack that. So it does have the ability to do that automatically for you, which is really nice. Yeah. 
<laughs> no, that's a great. It's a great technique. Definitely a great technique. Yep, it sends the email out. So um, there's um, there's the phishing portion of it. But what it'll also do is it'll track who clicked on it as well. So it'll create a unique link that when as soon as they click it, um, it'll track their name and everything else. So you can kind of go back and educate and stuff like that too. So it'll also do that as well. Uh, but you can definitely send the emails through the toolkit, which is great. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. It is, it is. So all of the attack vectors now that go for, um, for exploitation use that PowerShell injection technique now. Um, so for example, I just recently added um, PowerShell injection into Microsoft SQL. So you can do Microsoft SQL injection through PowerShell injection, which is really neat. So you can get remote code execution through Microsoft SQL. Um, there's a lot of different techniques that are built into that now that's been redesigned and converted. Um, 6.1 is almost out actually. So I, I, I do updates all the time. But uh, version 6.1, which will be pretty much done next week, um, adds a lot uh, more new uh, applicability to the Java Apple attack, where um, it basically creates a poly I just created a polymorphic engine that, that dynamically changes everything every time with AES encryption. Um, and, I, and, and I expanded on that a lot more to make it a lot e uh, harder to detect. Not at all, not at all. No, especially because I wouldn't, I wouldn't put an IP address up there. I'd actually register a domain name. And you can actually change the timing too. That was just for more demonstration purposes. But as soon as you click it, you can either have it go directly to your malicious website or um, you have it sit there for a little bit and then, and then flash it. It's so quick um, that you don't even notice it. I, I've never had anybody find, um, like, say, hey, this is suspicious. So you, you, you're not automatically signed into Gmail right now on your computer? Oh, well, you're, you're like the 1% of, of the human population because the persistent cookies, you know, that are in there, everybody's logged in uh, real time for those. So you'd automatically be logged into the machine. Um, so no, I haven't, I have never seen that. Uh, I've, I've probably used that technique, I mean, probably a thousand times. Uh, I mean, I haven't seen one instance where uh, someone's really picked it up, which has been great. <laughs> well, I guess I got it great for me, so. <laughs> I agree. I mean, that's not, I mean, people can, can spoof those links and make the links look, look not legitimate, and that's a big thing. I mean, we try to teach them the basics, and that's understandable, um, but that's not one that we should rely on. Well, what's the reload function there? Is it browser-specific? Nope, that's, that's the crummy part, is it works on all browsers. Um, it works on IE, works on all versions of IE, works on Firefox, works on Chrome, um, works on pretty much every browser-specific, so it doesn't make a difference, which is good. Again, good for us, bad for you guys. <laughs> that I sent uh, Katie a letter of apology for getting her show canceled. Uh, she actually had me on a second time uh, before her show got canceled, and that went really well too. So, I, and uh, but still got canceled. So I guess it wasn't that good. But never sent her a letter. Well, thank you all very much for having me. It was great, and uh, hopefully you enjoy the rest of DEF CON. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you.